giving a presentation on pressure canning with Carmen Lamoureux. So Carmen and I have been working together, uh, what is it, a year now? It's awesome. Carmen's been uh, co-teaching with us uh, with our permaculture design courses, and that's going to blossom into all sorts of other uh, incredible things to come as well. And so tonight, uh, I asked Carmen to come give a presentation to the Calgary Permaculture Community Group on pressure canning. It's the fall, it's time to be preserving. We've got all these bounty, this bounty coming out of our garden. And uh, just before I bring her up here, um, the Calgary Permaculture Community Group, where are you, Lisa? Do you want to come talk a little bit about it? Um, is a not-for-profit group here in Calgary. And our mission, I'll let you tell us our mission. I'll just bring Lisa up here and talk a little bit about the Calgary Permaculture Group. All right, so the Calgary Permaculture Guild is a community organization and we're about building community. So coming together, having real meaningful interactions, person to person, sharing information as we will do with Carmen tonight. And uh, we also share Im information member to member because we all have something to give to this community. Um, tonight we're here at a potluck. So we've all shared a fabulous meal I won't tell you too much about that because you guys weren't there on the internet to enjoy it with us. <laughs> but it was really good, full of diverse, healthy, locally grown, in most cases, organic food um, prepared with care and love for our friends. Um, we support permaculture in the community and beyond and are interested in providing positive um, alternatives in our paths for the future. Thanks. Thanks, Lisa. Awesome. So, um, so yeah, if you want to be part of these potlucks, we meet the same time, the same place every month. Uh, you can find that out on the Calgary Permaculture website. And I'll put a link to their website in the show notes below. Uh, but basically it's the third Saturday of every month at the Winston Heights Community Center here in Calgary. And uh, we'd love to see you. This room is not nearly at capacity yet. And uh, we, we can always take more food. So. If you're uh, tuning in on the internet and you want to be part of this community, make sure you show up. So without further ado, I'm going to bring Carmen out. Uh, Carmen runs Urban Farm School here in Calgary. She's one of Calgary's uh, incredible permaculture designers. She specializes in urban permaculture, forestry, sustainable design. I mean, the list goes on and also food preservation. And if you get a chance to go to one of her open yards in the summertime, I highly, highly recommend it. She probably has one of the most stunning gardens in the entire city. So, thanks, Carmen. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so guys, we're here tonight to talk about uh, pressure canning. So, this is the time of year when we're really thinking about how we can preserve the bounty of our harvest. So, central to permaculture is the process of growing nutrient dense food and nurturing our ecosystems in the process. So, one of the key um, one of, one of the key aspects, I think, of food preservation is one of the key things to consider is how do we, just as in permaculture, we diversify our food growing options, how do we then go ahead and diversify our food storage options, our food preservation options? Because just like in an ecosystem, that provides resiliency. So if, if we're only just harvesting everything, <coughs> throwing everything in the freezer, uh, then we we are setting ourselves up. It's basically a food preservation monoculture, right? So, so one of the reasons I love pressure canning and canning in general is that it gives me an option to preserve food in different ways. So for example, if I've got green beans to harvest, I can go ahead and dehydrate those and then grind them up into a powder and use those in soups and stews, so really nutrient dense. I can go ahead and freeze them. I can pickle them in many different ways. I can ferment them, but I can also can them. So one of the things I love about pressure canning, not as normal canning, but hot water bath canning, we'll talk about the differences between those today, is that it allows me the opportunity to preserve low acid foods or foods that have meat products in them. And I can do that safely and with absolute confidence. And, and it wouldn't be such a big deal for me. I'm kind of blessed because I don't like high acid foods. I have it, you know, it just bothers my stomach if I eat a lot of pickles. So I do a lot of pickling, but I don't do it for, for myself. I do it for other people in my family. But when it comes to eating foods that are harvested fresh from the garden, I'd rather eat them in a form that is not highly acidified. Uh, fermentation is a great uh, option for me, but 
Pressure canning is something that I think um, gives us a, an extra skill level to allow us to not only can low acid foods and foods that have meat products in them, let's like shellfish, et cetera, but it, what it also does is it, is it, it allows us the opportunity to actually create whole meals for ourselves. So instead of just having with, normally when we're preserving foods, we're preserving them in their individual state. So carrots are gonna be carrots and, and you know, beets are gonna be beets and beans are gonna be beans and, and you know, these various um, herbs and so on and spices are all going to be preserved in some form or fashion somewhat separately. But with the pressure canning option, what that allows you to do is combine all these different ingredients that you've harvested from your garden that are just as fresh as can be, put them together in a meal form, and now you've actually got a meal in a jar for yourself. So that's what I'm really passionate about that because if I'm going to process my food in a pressure canner, it, takes, it can take quite a bit of time and a lot of uh, resources when it comes to energy. So if I'm going to do that, why not create the full meal all at once? So I'm really keen on doing that. And I'd like you guys to explore that as well. So um, I'm not going to be touching on general canning that much today other than to show the difference between the two, but mostly focusing on pressure canning. So for canning, generally, these are the kinds of products that we can, we can can, fresh vegetables, fruit, pickled vegetables, condiments, preserves, soups and stews, broths, sauces, and meats. So most of the goals, most of the time, the goal of food preservation is to stop enzymatic decay. So the moment you pick your vegetable, the moment you harvest your animal, that's when enzymatic decay starts to come in. So that process is already in place. There's bacteria coming in from the environment, there's bacteria inherent in that animal itself that is starting to cause that decomposition process. So the process of uh, preserving food is really designed to stop that enzymatic decay, but it's also, uh, the purpose is also to stop in its tracks any kind of pathogenic organisms that may wreak havoc with your, with your product. So what we wanna do is not only get rid of what's uh, in the atmosphere as far as what might come into your product while you're preserving it, but also anything that might be present in that product. So because we grow food in the soil, there's a lot of very diversity of microorganisms at play. So we wanna make sure that in our canning process or in our food preservation process that we're addressing that. So these are some of the main, you know, uh, organisms of concern, right? Phosphoridium botulinum, botulism, Escherichia coli, E. coli, Listeria, and Salmonella. And what's really important is that when it comes to meat products and low acid foods, this is where botulism really likes to take hold. So our goal is to stop pathogens, as I mentioned, but also to get rid of what's already present. So botulism toxins can be destroyed. Just the toxins themselves can be destroyed by boiling, a boiling water temperature, which is 212 degrees but it cannot destroy the spores. So your botulism, there may be botulism spores in the air or in the product around you, which haven't yet completely manifested the toxin, the toxin that will kill them. But if you don't kill that spore, then you're in trouble. And that's where pressure canning comes in. And that's why it's such an important tool for us. So we've got these two types of canning mechanisms that we regularly see. We've got a hot water bath canner, now this is primarily used for processing high acid foods, uh, pickles and preserves that are where a lot of sugar is going in there. And all of those things actually help uh, with bacteria, but not for meats and not for the acid foods. Pressure canners, this is what these are for. And I've got two examples here, I'll go through those in a bit. So hot water bath canner, as I mentioned earlier, for safety in hot water bath canning, you have to reach 212 degrees. So one of the issues that we have here is because we're at a higher elevation. This 200, water boils at 212 degrees at sea level. And every thousand feet above that, you have to add more time to get that temperature right. So, so that, that's, but at, at um, okay, I'm not in that yet. So I changed my slides all around. So yes, you must increase processing time to to deal with that. So that's why in our climate, 
If your recipe says at sea level that you need to process in a hot water bath canner for 15 minutes, you typically want to add another 10 minutes to that to make sure you understand what your altitude is. In a pressure canner, however, we have to reach 240 degrees. You can't do that in a hot water bath canner. 240 degrees is what's required to kill botulism spores. So this is why a pressure canner is so important. So it's the same idea. It also responds to atmospheric pressure. So the higher you are in altitude, the more pressure you need to add. <clears throat> so we'll talk about that. We'll start from A to Z and go through the whole process. So when you're looking at um, recipe books, make sure you understand your elevation. So we are at what here, Rob? We're at uh, just over a thousand meters. A thousand meters. So that's so 3,200 3, feet or yeah. something. Yeah. So typically I process everything in my pressure canner at 15 pounds of pressure. And I'll, I'll explain what that means later. So as here, as we go up in elevation, in water bath canning, we increase time. But in pressure canning, we increase pressure. That's what gives us our safety net. So when we look at altitude adjustments, here we go. Um, boiling water canner, altitude in feet. So for one to 3,000 feet, five minutes. Three to 6,000 feet, 10 minutes. That's a boiling water canner. So this is what we would do. Any recipe you read in any of the canning books, if you understand what your elevation is, you can add that. Absolute safety. In pressure canners, we're looking at 15 pounds safely. So I've got two different kinds of canners here to show you. One's a dial gauge canner and one's just a weighted gauge canner. But these are very, very close together. I always go to 15 pounds per square inch, especially if I'm cooking anything with meat products in it. So when do you decide, like what decides uh, whether to use a hot water bath canner or a pressure canner? And typically that's determined by the pH of your product. So if you can see high acid foods here, any of these high acid foods, we've got, I know it's kind of small, lemons, pickles, gooseberries, apricots, plums, apples, blackberries, sour cherries, peaches, sauerkraut, pears, tomatoes are kind of on the cusp here. So even in hot water bath canners, the general rule of thumb is for a, a, a quart jar like this, if you're, whatever, whatever tomato product you're canning, to so add a tablespoon of lemon juice. So lemon juice, and, and as opposed to vinegar, because lemon juice has a known and very regular level of acidity. So it's a determinable level of acidity. So that's why they recommend that. If you want to use vinegar, that's okay. Apple cider vinegar is good, but put a little more than that, a tablespoon and a half. So that's with tomatoes, because they're right on the edge. Low acid foods, you can see they're right in that bacterial zone here where bacteria will grow like crazy. So these are the these are the foods that you must process in a hot water bath counter if you want to make them. So the nice thing is is that I can pickle carrots, but then I can also just pick my little baby carrots and put them into a jar and process them without any concern whatsoever. And all my green beans and beets and so on. So a lot of storage crops are really great canned. Peas and corn are pretty neutral. They also all of those have to be put into a pressure canner process. These kinds of um, charts are available on the internet, so you can, you can access those there. So some basic tips for general canning success. Food safety first, especially when it comes to meat products. You have to make sure that your surfaces are super clean. You've got to start with, with really clean jars, so make sure all your equipment is clean. Um, depending on where you're storing your equipment. These are big behemoths. And sometimes, you know, I've stored them in my garage a lot and we've got mice in the garage. So I always clean these thoroughly before I use them. They're stored in the garage. The same goes with my jars. Like this, these jars. Typically what I'll do is after I've cleaned my jars, is I'll, these I, I typically do replace unless they're absolutely pristine. But I'll clean them, wash my jars, and then I'll put them upside down in my box. So I know they've been washed and cleaned. If they're new jars, they'll be face up with this in them. So I have a big supply of jars, so I have to kind of keep track. But at least this way, I can be pretty certain that the mice aren't getting them inside there. So um, 
The other thing is to use the right equipment for the job. So when it comes to pressure canning, you absolutely must avoid using Instapots. Okay, they cannot reach 240 degrees reliably. You have to reach at least 240 degrees. The other thing you don't want to do is use a pressure cooker. A pressure cooker is not the same as a pressure can. Okay. Also, I'd like to advise that if you invest in buying a pressure canner that you don't use it for pressure cooking. <laughs> and you think, well, that's a two-in-one thing. That's awesome. But here's the deal is that these guys have this little release valve vent here. And this, this, is, this is your emergency vent. And also this thing needs to vent properly. When you're cooking in here, these get gummed up pretty badly. And so if you start canning with this and this is gummed up, you could end up with a disaster in your kitchen. I have seen photographs of entire stoves that have been completely demolished by a pressure canner that has blown up. So we really don't want to do that. So that's why I suggest if you if you one that you use for pressure cooking or just get a regular pressure cooker, but they're not as heavy duty as these pressure canners. So at, reserve that. At 15 PSI, it'll get it should go to 250 Fahrenheit. Yeah. 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 So that's why it's such a safe, especially in our altitude. Um, follow the recipes exactly. This is really this is just a general canning thing. So Acidity levels are really more um, uh, important when we're dealing with hot water bath canning. It's not such a big deal when we're doing pressure canning. Recipes. And only use jars made for canning. So sometimes you can buy that classical um, tomato sauce and it looks like a canning jar, right? And you can still find lids that fit that size, but don't use those because the glass is not thick enough to withstand pressure canning, okay? Don't use those, it's very, very unsafe. So the basic components of a pressure canner, pretty simple actually. We we'll talk about these two styles here. This one is a, what we call just a regular weighted gauge pressure canner. This is a Miro brand. Take that out. Right. So inside every pressure canner, just like in a hot water bath canner, you usually have one of these in the box. Okay, so this allows you to place your cans on here, your jars on here, and it actually helps protect the jars from overheating and thus cracking. So we're gonna talk about how to prevent that as well. So here's what is called a pet cock. Okay, this is your pressure valve. And I don't know if you guys can see it, but it's got a five, 10 and 15 pound um, marking on the side. And basically what you do, and we'll talk about the actual step-by-step -step procedure as we go along. Once this guy is, is locked into place, let me do that backwards. I think I did. I'm sure that's creating havoc on your, on your microphone here. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so this basically fits on here. Okay, so that's that style. This is called a dial gauge um, pressure canner. Quite a different animal. Um, one thing I did show you, whoops, I did not show you in this one, was that. You see, there's a rubber seal in there around the edge, right? One of the characteristics of that, of that style. This one, however, does not have a seal. no seal. So some people really like these, especially if you're a permie or you're interested in survival or whatever, because these seals eventually will kind of break down and you need to have uh, extra ones on hand. In our climate, it gets a little dry. So depending on where you're storing them, um, in our climate, I don't recommend you store them in like an unheated garage or an unheated space because that that uh, cold and heat will cause them to crack over time. But this one here, it doesn't have a seal doesn't have a, a, a gasket. So what we use, good old Vaseline, we just take a little bit of that and we rub that around here, just a light seal. So when we put this on, it actually, lock, we lock it down and it actually seals really well. So this one is a, is a dial gauge 
It also comes with a pet cock await. What this affords us is the opportunity to have a backup. So we know when we're reaching 15 pounds of pressure, right? So it's a kind of a backup. Because there's no seal in here, this is really, really essential. We have to be certain that we're getting a good seal and that we've got the pound that we're, we're building pressure, okay? So that's why these have a, a, an actual gauge. So these are fantastic. They're a little more of a production, I should say, than this one, but um, fantastic and will last an entire lifetime. They're wonderful. So this one also has a relief, a release valve as well. So important. You're going to buy one if you buy Which one would you buy? Um, hmm. I like them both. They both have completely different characteristics. I think if you, I think if you're a beginner and you're not sure how much canning you're going to do, you could start with this one. I think it gives you a comfort level knowing there's a gasket in there already, as long as you're comfortable. This is a little more interpretive. We'll go through the process of, because this thing is going to rock a bit. And when we get it to rock at a certain rate, um, we'll know that we can start time. We'll go through that later. But with that one, um, I think as, I think if you're comfortable enough with having um, to put the Vaseline on and, and get a good seal, then no problem. That's a lifetime pot. You never have to buy a new seal for the inside. Of that. So it's a matter of getting used to using it. I like them both and I'll use them both. So we're gonna go through the pro process, the actual step-by-step -step process of how to run through a pressure counting session because it's super easy. So when we're looking at our produce, whether that's meat or vegetables, we have to decide whether we're gonna do a cold pack versus a hot pack. No matter whether you're doing a cold, so if that, what that means is cold pack is you're putting cold product. And usually that's only a vegetable, okay? A vegetable, not meats, meats have to be heated. Or a hot product. So why that's important is that your, your jars are always going to be hot. So if you've got something like green beans, you know that if you've blanched your beans ahead of time, they're going to turn that bright green, right? Are we familiar with blanching? Does anybody here not know what blanching is? I know what it is, but I don't do it right. Because, okay. Like, yeah, so basically you've got a rolling boil of hot water in a pot. You throw your beans in for like 30 seconds, and then you plunge them into a sink full of ice cold water with ice cubes in it. So all you're doing is you're, you're stopping the enzyme decay really, really quickly. And in the process, you're getting that really bright green color, which makes it look a little more powerful. But, um, you can do that with other things as well. But one of the advantages to doing a cold uh, or a hot pack of beans is that you can fit more beans in the jar. But one of the disadvantages to doing a hot pack of beans is that your beans are already slightly cooked before they actually get cooked a lot. So, um, but the hot pack, I typically recommend for pressure canning because number one, you can fit a lot more product in there and you're putting hot product into hot jars, which minimizes jar breakage, okay? So we prepare our veggies. That means we make sure that everything is clean, cut, ready to go, our surfaces are all clean and we've got everything ready. That might mean if we're making a soup and we want to can a soup, like I've made a batch of, um, And so I basically created my soup and I had it on the stove ready to go hot enough to put it into hot jars. So number one is preparing your product, getting, make, making sure that that's ready to go. Then we prepare our jars. We make sure that we start with clean jars. They don't have to be sterilized ahead of time when you're doing pressure can, like they do when you're doing um, more hot water bath can. So we move the lids, these little lids, and I just place those into a small little pot, open pot, and uh, set those aside, and then I set the screw bands aside. And then I put my oven on at 200 degrees and I put a cookie sheet in it and I put all of my clean jars, just like this, upright like this, in the oven. And I want to have warm, like really hot jars. 200 degrees is about right. Keep them nice and warm. And, uh, and then I put a kettle of water on to boil. And I'll show you why. So now we're going to prepare our pressure canner. So what we're doing here is we're, we've already cleaned our canner. We put the spacer plate in the bottom, that little plate. 
and we add about, I usually start with three inches of water. The thing with pressure canners is that unlike a hot water bath canner, you don't have to cover your jars with water. So in a hot water bath, you wanna have about two inches of water over top of your jars, right? No matter what the size is. But in the pressure canner, you don't need to do that. What you need to do is make sure you've got enough water in the pressure canner that it doesn't run dry because it's cooking for a lot longer than a hot water bath canner will. So what I start with is about three inches of water and later I can adjust that. But also you have to remember that because this thing is like super hot and produces a lot of pressure, you can't use a canner like this on a flat top stove on one of those ceramic top stoves. So what I do in that case is I have one of these units at home as well. I have a gas stove, but sometimes I don't want to can in the house because pressure canning takes a lot longer, produces a lot more noise, um, and it's hot. So this is a great option, a single burner or a double burner. It's a little propane. It's really great for pressure canning. So to prepare our lids, basically we've got the little lids in a small pot, and then I just cover those with some of that boiling water. And I just put them on a back burner. Don't boil them. You don't want to... You don't want to distort this rubber bit around here. You just want to soften it. So we cover it with boiling water and we just put it on the back of the stove, super low heat, just to keep the water hot, but not boiling. Okay, so we just want to soften that. All right, then we basically we take one jar at a time out of the oven. This is, this is the way that I do it. There are a lot of methods. Some people take five jars out at a time. But I find that by the time you get your product in the jar, the jars are starting to really cool off really, really quickly. So I take them out of my oven one jar at a time. I fill the hot jars with my hot soup or stew or my, or, or my vegetables. If I'm using raw vegetables like um, spinach or Swiss chard, they, they can go in cold. That's a raw pack. And then they'll be just covered with some boiling water. Just pour some of that boiling water into your, into your um, jars. And headspace in pressure canning is a little bit, you'll look at the recipes there, it's a little bit um, larger than uh, you would find in a hot water bath canning. So that's because that pressure is forcing the air out of your jar lid. So an, a recipe that might call for an inch of headspace in hot water bath canning, let's say for a tomato sauce, if you're doing the same recipe, but you're doing it in a pressure canner, it might call for an inch and a half of headspace. So if you want to err on the side of caution, then add a little more headspace rather than less. Because what will happen is that if you add too little headspace, if you're thinking, oh, well, I can fill this right up to the top, you throw that in the pressure canner, you're going to find that half of your product is going to end up in your, in your processing water. Okay, and you'll get some really bad siphoning out of this jar. So better to err on the side of more headspace than less. That's something that's really important with hot water bath with the uh, pressure canning. So one of the things we want to do before we put our lid on, so our lid is sitting in its little jar and it's in its little um, pot and it's nice and warm. When we've got our headspace out, we just take a, a paper towel or a, or a napkin or uh, you know a nice clean dishcloth and we just dip it in a little vinegar and we wipe our lids off with vinegar. The reason we do that is that one of the main reasons that seals fail on uh, pressure canning uh, jars is because of fat. Okay, so if your product has fat in it, then you have to be double careful. And make sure that this lid has no fat on it. And then you can put your lid on, and then you take your screw top, and you basically, slightly tighter than you would for hot water bath canning. So, you want to put it on just fingertip tight, just like that. Not loose. If you leave it too loose, you're going to lose product out of the top. Do when you when it's just got a little resistance, then just go a little more, but not not a wrist tight. If you do that, your jars will probably explode. So if you, it's really just a matter of just playing with that and finding out. That's all it takes. There's enough give in there to force the air out, but not enough to allow the product to come up. Okay. And then when you're done filling your jars each jar at a time, it goes into the canner and just sits into that water. So that, that canner has already got three inches of water, which has been heated up already. So it's not boiling, but it's really hot. So you're putting 
pot jars with hot product, unless it's a raw vegetable that you want to preserve like that, like leafy greens, Swiss chard, spinach, that sort of thing. Um, most of the time you'll have hot product in there, so you might want to make sure it goes into hot water. Keep it nice and warm. So here's the case where we've just got basic cut up beans and they're just being covered with boiling water. Right to the right hand space and then that's covered. Walk it to the... the reason you can do more uh, jars like this is because you're putting boiling water in them. The water is just boiled and it's ready to go in so those jars aren't going to cool off. So once the pressure canner is you're filling You don't really need the water to go to the top. Okay, so the ultimate end game here is that you've got your water at about this level. So if you've got quart sized jar or not quart sized jars, pint sized jars, the smaller jars, you want to get the water to about just below the just below the lid. That's a general safety rule of thumb. The reason we want to go so high on these big guys is because they process a lot longer than the smaller jars. Okay, so if you're if you're processing tiny little half pint jars, let's say you're doing um, canning salmon or something like that. Uh, you need to have the water really at the, about the same level as the jar. So, question? Yeah, and what if you're going to stack like a bunch of those oh, yeah. on top of each other? No, that's our camera runs dry, it will explode. <laughs> so we don't want to have that happen. So yeah, as long as you generally follow the rule of thumb to get your water near the top, near the bottom of your lid, you're gonna be you're gonna be very safe. So once we've got our lids in and we turn that heat to high, we've got to put our lid on, make sure it's fixed. You can see that this one has all these fancy dudes on it. So basically, with a um, let's get this on properly. So I'm going to make some more noise. I think. There we go. So when you when you've got one of these um, uh, um, dial uh, gauge pressure canners, what you want to do is start with. I'm not lined up properly here. Do one on one side, and then we do the opposite side. Tighten those up at the same time, just a little bit at a time. And then we'll take these two, do the same thing. Yeah, we had to close this whole thing when we were traveling because it was making such a racket. Basically, you want to get that down nice and firmly, right? Once you've got them all done. And of course, you've already put your stuff on. Make sure your lids are done. These will always tell you when they're, you can always tell when they're, when they're really firmly affixed. So we want to get that heat going to high because now we want to get that water boiling. So once the canner starts to vent, whoops, this is not supposed to be on here yet. Don't start with this on your canner, you'll fail. Okay? <laughs> once your canner begins venting steadily, so once it comes to a boil, you're going to see steam coming out of here. Here and here, you'll see steam. At first, it'll start with in fits and starts. So you, you want to wait until you've got a steady, steady stream, like a geyser. Just Once it starts doing that, now you can put your pet cock on. If you're doing meat, uh, or at our, at our altitude, 15 pounds per square inch goes on. Put this one on, 15 pounds per square inch. At this point, we start timing, 10 minutes. You need a timer for this process because it's not interpretive. So 10 minutes, this thing has to, uh, oh, sorry, 10 minutes, it has to vent. 10 minutes, it has to vent without the pet cock, 10 full minutes. After 10 minutes, you can put this on. There we go. Is that on 15? Probably not. Yeah, yeah, we'll pass that around and show. So after this is vented for 10 minutes and you've got this pet cock on, it's going to start to make a sound after a little bit. It's going to start to I'll do this one because it's a fix. You'll start to hear this kind of sound. And then it'll stop. And then it'll go. And then it'll stop. 
Once it starts doing it regularly, now you start timing. So if your recipe says 75 minutes, that's when you set the timer. You say, okay, 75 minutes. It says 90 minutes, which is all meats. You run it for 90, it's gotta do this for 90 minutes. It's a lot of noise. Plus it's venting. It's going to... Right? So, um, so that stays on there for the entire 90 minutes. If at some stops for like five minutes, if you've turned your heat down too low, your heat's not high enough and it stops, then you've got to start over. So what you don't want to do is lose pressure. So you st once it starts going again, you start your timing again. All it means is that the food in your jars is cooking a little bit longer. So you don't have to worry about that. But honestly, keep your heat on, heat on high and just make sure that you start your timing for your recipe when this thing starts to just wiggle regularly. So those are the things that people get a little freaked out about. This is a very simple process. You just have to understand that when you get this heating, it needs to vent naturally for 10 full minutes and you have to start timing. You let it vent for 10 full minutes and then you put the pet cock on and then you wait until you get the regular rocking and then you start timing for your recipe, okay? That's a very simple thing. So once your canning time is complete, you've got the timer on and the timer has gone off now. Now what you wanna do is just turn off your heat. Don't move your pressure canner to another burner because you've got to make something else. Let it sit. Don't take this off. Don't remove the lid. There's way too much pressure in here to be doing that. So typically 20 to 30 minutes, 30 minutes is safe. Just leave it alone. Don't move it, don't do anything. The reason you don't want to move it is that those jars inside are highly pressurized. And if you try to move it and they knock up against each other, you could blow, you could blow a jar. You don't want to do that. So half an hour, you can take this off. You should not have any steam escaping at this point. It should be completely depressurized. If you do have a little steam coming out, that's no problem. And then at that point, you can open your jar or open your canner and you just open it away from you because there's a lot of heat there and you can scald yourself, okay? Okay, so I'll make this one. So basically, um, once you've opened your, your canner, so what you wanna do is have a prepared area. You don't wanna be taking these super, super hot jars and putting them onto a cold surface because if you do that, you'll get what's called siphoning. And same thing will happen if you try to depressurize this container too quickly. If you try to take this pet cock off too soon, or you try to lift the lid off, even if you can manhandle it, uh, and it's kind of dangerous to do, even if you can do that, what's going to happen is that because the pressure hasn't equalized inside the pressure canner, you're going to get siphoning. And that basically means that the contents of this jar are going to come out it's gonna release itself, right? So the seal is going to break or you'll end up with a broken jar. So better to just let, you've gone to all this trouble to do this, all this preparation. Um, you've used a lot of resources already. So now it's, it's time to practice patience. So when you're taking your jars out, the broth that was sitting right on my counter, you take each jar out and you put it either onto a wooden, wooden cutting board or just a couple tea towels. Because if you put it right on your counter, the counter's cold. And you'll see, even just putting on the tea towel, you'll see a lot of action. You'll see a lot of bubbling up, right? There's a lot going on in there. So once you get that jar, don't, don't tilt it. Don't take it out and try to tilt it. You know, there's gonna be water sitting on the top. The seal will be down. You don't wanna tilt it. That could cause problems inside. Um, just put it directly onto your tea towel and just let it cool and don't move it until it's cool. Okay. So once it's cooled off, then if you, if you, sometimes you get a lot of, because we have a lot of hard water here. If you come and look at the inside of this, you can see there's a lot of calcification in here, like, you know, deposits and so on. Um, you can just use some vinegar and water on a towel and wipe that off. And then you can put your labels on, which is cool. And then it can be moved around and jiggled around, juggled with if you like, it doesn't matter. But um, yeah, so that's, that's it. So um, Anything that you really love to eat, if you want to make like a, a beautiful beef stew or a curried chicken or anything like that, make it how you like it, all spiced up. 
heat it up, put it in your jars, look at some of the existing recipes in some of the, um, some really good books, Bryn Darden has a good book, Gall has a good book, and anything with a meat product in it will give you, or if it's fairly liquid, will give you a guideline on headspace. Just follow that. If you have to guess, just add a little more space than you think you might need. If you end up with a little uh, space at the top, not a problem. So um, a couple rules of thumb, however, if you're making soups and stews, don't use a thickening agent in your soup. So if you're making um, you know, pea soups and that sort of thing, no problem. You don't typically add flour <coughs> or cornstarch or anything like that. But if you're making a stew, a beef stew or, um, or a chicken stew or, you know, the filling for a chicken pot pie or something, the tendency would be to add a thickening agent. But what you want to do is not, is really avoid doing that and add it in after when you're actually preparing your, your food and you're heating it up at that time. The reason is, is that the pressure here in the extreme heat actually separates those components and you end up with this really gross kind of glommy, uh, very distasteful looking product. So um, one of the things I really, really, really love about pressure canning is that it allows me to, um, it allows me to, to, to preserve my product in a form <coughs> that is ready to eat, really like that. Uh, when I make a soup in this, and there's enough here for Christian and I to share. And I also, if I'm making, um, say pea soup or whatever, I can make a full jar that we can share, but if he's not interested, I've got the little pint jars. It's just one serving, it's perfect for me. So um, these are great for emergency preparedness, for, for getting us through that hunger gap. It's really, really important. We've got about uh, 240 days when we are not able to harvest food from the garden in our climate. So when we think about how best to diversify our food storage options, I think pressure canning is a option, especially if we um, if we're harvesting our own meats and so on. This I think is one of the best ways to to uh, moose, elk, venison, fish, everything. And one wonderful thing about canning wild meat is, I think it's the structure of the meat fibers, but when one is to chop them up into one inch chunks, add, add some boiling water and, uh, and a couple of tablespoons of salt, and you can it just like that. And what happens is the fibers in the meat really, really break down. And what comes out, of this after 90 minutes of processing is absolutely the most delectable soft meat. It's like you could cut it with a fork. It's so beautiful. So there's something really great about that. But I would prefer personally to actually make a beautiful, rich venison stew, you know, with everything in it and put it in this jar. That's how I like it. But, but it, the nice thing about doing this though, however, is you can harvest an animal and get it processed pretty quickly. If you're not fussing, if you just want to do a straight raw, we talked about raw pack the other day, right? So that's totally, totally okay to do, but you typically want to cover it with boiling water. So you want to have a hot liquid and a hot, because otherwise, you know, you've got to have some liquid. The only time you don't have to add a lot of liquid is if you're using the small jars, like the, if you're canning, um, canning venison in a small, small jar, or you're canning salmon in a small jar, you don't need to add any liquid because there's enough juice in there. to take care of the processing. But when you're using a large jar like this, if you want to process meat and soap and water, or if you've got broths, not nice one broths, that's a really good idea too. So uh, yeah, are there any questions, guys? Yes? Why do you bend it for 10 minutes? What's that process do? That's, that's to get, get you to, yeah, you, you have to repeat the question. Pardon me, oh, so why vent it for 10 minutes? Now, this is part of the this is, this is part of getting that getting it pressurized inside. It's actually not pressurized yet, but we're making sure that the water is at at a really 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 high temperature, right? So we know that by letting it vent for ten minutes, that we absolutely reach that temperature. Now we can put the pressure on it, and the pressure will get us back up, like way up. Would that be imperative if you have the dial? 
It's imperative. Yeah. Yeah. Aren't Don't. you getting the oxygen out too? You're getting the oxygen out too. Because it's venting, it comes out as, as steam. Right? So in order to build that pressure, that oxygen has to be gone. So, but 10 minutes, that's, that's, that's standard across the board. Doesn't matter what size jars you're using. <clears throat> so the processing time will, will be less with a, um, the pint size jar as, it, as opposed to this. Smaller jars are even less. But you're still going to, with any meat product, you're still going to use 15 pounds of pressure typically 90 minutes. That's a general rule of thumb and it's pretty steadfast. So anything, whether that's a bone broth or if you've got just a little bit of meat in your soup or your stew, it's still the same. Vegetables typically end up less if it's just a vegetarian dish. Any more questions? Yes, more um, so I've heard that some of the older recipes might be out of state. Is that true? Yeah. yeah. But then, you know what it is open? Well, some you know, there were there were you know like the Hutterites used to actually pressure not pressure can hot water bath can potatoes to a low acid food, and. You know, one of, one of the, there was actually a very, uh, was well known a number of years ago, but it was a big uh, botulism event where a few people died because the Hutterite women opened up these cans of, or these jars of um, canned potatoes and wanted to make potato salad with it. So they made potato salad and so many people got sick and a few people died. So, and that was because they had killed the botulism toxin, but not the spores. Now, if you were cooking those potatoes, then the extra added heat that you would have provided would have actually killed more of the toxin, Not wouldn't have touched the spores, but the botulism toxin itself was still present because it wasn't canned properly. So um, there's a lot of old time canning techniques. When I think of the kind of stuff my mom did, I mean, she was a real prairie adventurous. We lived through it, thankfully, but she was pretty, she was a nurse too, so she was pretty diligent about things. But um, that's the issue I, I see, even looking at canning images on Google. I saw some of those to throw these in here tonight. I saw some stuff that just made me cringe. <laughs> like, I, honestly, there were hot water bath canners where the, where the jars were half out of the water. And they were processing them like that, which is completely, completely bad news. Like one of the things about pressure canning is you have to, you're forcing that 240 degree temperature into the, into the very interior of that food. And, and, and you can't do that with a pressure cooker and you can't do that with a hot water bath can. You've got to get 240 degrees to the very center of your food. And that's why the processing times are so long for pressure canning is because you have to be absolutely certain that you've gotten in there to do that. So um, Dakota asked a question uh, on Wednesday when we were doing this, well, doesn't all that long processing time destroy what's in the food? But the fact is, is that everything is self-contained in here. So all of those nutrients are still in here. They're in the jar, they're self-contained. So um, anytime you heat food, you're gonna lose some uh, level of nutritive quality, but you wanna actually so, as um, perhaps not as nutrient dense in the long run as eating something raw, but it allows us in our climate and in our context to make it through the hunger gap. So this is why in our in our context, this is a very, very, very important tool for us to, to have in our toolkit. So yeah, but you know how do you how do you find the texture and the fragrance of the vegetables after uh, yeah. as you can? Yeah, I mean they're gonna be soft, you know, they're gonna be soft. Um and that's that's why I think the diversification of our food storage options is so important. Um one of the things that we know, like with our carrots, um, we can grow enough in a four by ten foot bed to last us all winter. We've got carrots all winter. But by the end, you know, they're getting pretty hairy. And if they're not stored quite right, they're kind of, you know, 
and uh, the quality definitely starts to tank right towards late spring. But if you've got some carrots canned and some carrots pickled, you've got you've got something to cut. Kind of, you know, I don't like soggy or at least super soft vegetables. I like mine with a bit of crunch. Um, I'm willing to. Compromise on that when it gives me that longevity in my food source. Yeah, that garbage. The flavor is still there. The flavor is still there. So, and it, and you can really enhance that. So, I mean, when you when you buy a can of, I mean, I can't remember when I ever bought a can of peas. Um, but <laughs> but there's there's just like <laughs> if you closed your eyes and you put a spoon in your mouth, you have no idea what you were eating. I mean, the texture is disgusting and the color is awful and there's no flavor, right? But um, but when you're doing your own stuff, I mean, let's be clear. I mean, we're harvesting, as, you know, we're, we're doing our processing as soon after harvesting as possible, and that's important for uh, vegetables, but also for our meats, right? We want to make sure that we're canning as fresh as we can to capture that not only the not only the nutritive quality, but the life essence of that food. Right? We want to be able to dance with. That's kind of why I like doing the full meal deal in these, I don't mind having a couple jars of, of canned carrots or you know, processed carrots, but I'm not going to eat them all winter long because they're just not my thing. I'd probably take these and put them into a soup. I probably wouldn't eat them just like that. I'd probably rather eat my kind of hairy ones growing in a root cellar, you know, I'd probably do that. But, um, but if I can make a beautiful um, vegetable chicken soup with, with those carrots, I have no problem, you know. So canning them in a form in which they are already part of something else and adding really beautiful bone broths and so on to that and creating something. So another thing you don't want to add in here are noodles, no pasta products, <laughs> right? They'll completely turn into something really disgusting. Um, so no pasta, no flour products at all. Um, and if you want to process, like I said, if you, if you want to process high fat meats or high fat products, um, you have to be really, if the seal is going to fail, it's usually because of fat. So, so just keep in mind that um, if, you're, if you're processing high fat foods, that there's a possibility that your seal will fail. As much. How long would you expect to have a jar viable? <laughs> oh, a long, long time. If your seal is good, and you can always tell your, your seal is good. The nice thing about using jars is that it's not like a can. You're not going to end up with that really horrible metallic. Because I don't know if you've ever had canned tomatoes that are like you know, four years old or whatever. It's like it's not it's not necessarily um, it's not pathogenic or anything like that. But it's very distasteful. Like you can't you can hardly eat it for the metallic flavor. But you won't get that here. You could can you could have them last for four years. Oh, absolutely. And storage obviously of pressure canned items, especially meat, is really key. So you do want to keep these in a dark place in a cool place. So, you know, a cold storage room or something like that would be ideal, away from sunlight um, and cool. That lasts a lot longer. Um, I have been trying to source out some amber canning jars, quart canning jars, um, uh, for a reasonable price, because I think for meats, that would be really amazing. I think you get a lot more longevity of canned products. So as long as your seal is good, and I use a, um, recently I've been using a white pen marker for my canning jars, so I can put all my information on there. When you use the little sticky ones, they fade over time. So if you've got something for a couple of years, sometimes you can't even tell what it was. One of the things that, that um, my mom uh, told me one time was that when she was a kid, her, her mom would, uh, with the two or three or four year old laying hens, that had stopped laying eggs in there, but they were too tough to eat. Yeah. They basically stuffed, like, you know, kill it first. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and then stuffed the entire bird inside, like, a canning jar. A canning jar. And then just pressure can. That's right. And I don't think, can you speak to that at all? Oh, yeah, absolutely. That, that, my mom used to do that too. And what was really great about that is that <laughs> the bones would turn to nothing. Like, the bones would become so soft. The bones in a smaller laying hand are quite small. And so, yeah, you just, your bones and everything would just go in. You know, so mom would often just kind of take the bird part and put it in and it would just 
want canned meat, no. but somehow when you know where it comes from, it's great. And the other option is that um, if you're willing to take the extra step of things like chicken, if you want to chop up your chicken and then just let Um, and actually it's a lot tastier and got a little more texture to it than just this kind of soft meat. But that soft meat can be used in anything. Yes. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. They're 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 made for canning and they're really great. So there's, there's uh, you know, the, the smaller ones, the uh, one pint ones, there's these, and then there's even a larger size. And those are all doable in, in this. So um, if you're going to stack your jars, I would suggest that you get an extra one of these, which you can buy. So if you're doing quart size jars, like even this will take, mm, it'll take these plus a smaller jar, um, but some of them are quite a bit bigger. Like this one could probably take two and you stack them, basically just put another another row. But you don't have to increase the amount of water to make the water the same level here. So, because they'll all process with the pressure. Any other questions? Yes? Okay. Um, I love something about them that is too deep on our meat and fish. Yes, <laughs> that was common practice. Yeah. Yeah. But, but, you know, like I usually tell people in my classes, just because your grandmother did it that way, just because we used to do it that way, yeah. doesn't mean you should continue to do it that way. Because it's kind of like the way we deal with soil health now, right? It's like dealing with old farmers that say, well, we've always done it this way. And some of the most resistant people are people that are attached to the way things Always been done. Yeah, acidic. Like, they do it. Want to do that? I'm yeah. Just wondering how they survive. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like if you, yeah, <laughs> without a doubt. Um, obviously, acidity is going to help, but with, when it comes to meat, you have to reach 240 degrees, and you can't do that. Like just safely kill, you know, uh, botulism, listeria, salmonella, E. coli. You have to reach 240 degrees, and you can't do that in a hot water tank. So, yeah. You know, so the more we learn. Yeah. the better equipped we are, right? Yeah. And you mentioned not to use wheat products and stews. It, does that go, is that also for, say, barley and millet? Yes, barley is, is another one that you should not put in. It just becomes, it explodes and becomes this gummy kind of um, unrecognizable mass. You know, really, really, it's just really not. And rice as well. I, I don't put rice in. So really any, any green cereal? Yeah, anymore. yeah. Okay. Because, I mean, honestly, you're it's superheating it. And then you're letting it sit for a couple of years. So it's not really that great. You know, you and those are things you can add after really easily. Well, that's a zombie apocalypse. That's like you really yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I have so. a quick question. Do you yeah. have to use the Vaseline or can you use like another oil substance like olive oil? Or um, I think it's the viscosity of the Vaseline that makes it work so well. Um, I, yeah. I'd be really, really dubious about if you if you wanted to try it, you could. However, you'd have to watch this like a hawk and make sure you're not getting any steam leaking out the side, right? So when this is on nice and tight, if you've got this on properly, like not too heavy a glom, just a thin, thin um, layer here, not not too thin that you can't see it, and you can't feel it. It's got to be there. But when this gets on, you should have a pretty airtight seal. But if you were just to use oil, I'm not sure that, that there's that level of viscosity present to do that. So this is what's recommended to use with these canners. Yeah, so of course I've got pressure canner written on it so it doesn't get used for anything. Else. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions, guys? Yeah. 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 My voice is a little bit rough today. So. I should have brought a bunch of recipes for you guys. So, do you have a source that you recommend that aren't old school Chinese? Um, the newest Bernard and Ball books are really good. There's some really um, great new canning books out in um, in Indigo or in Chapters. Chapters are still around, actually. Chapters is Indigo. Is Indigo, yeah. 
So there are some good up to date ones. And um, let's start a recipe exchange. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, that's yeah. the thing, though. Like, yeah. if somebody put a recipe in the book, we don't know where it was sourced yeah. from. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. But, but let me tell you, I mean, when it comes to pressure canning, it's actually a little more forgiving than than a hot water bath canning. Because hot water bath canning, you've got to have that certain level of acidity. Um, and it's not really interpretive. Like, you've got to know that you've reached a surpassed point of acidity to, to can successfully. With pressure canning, you can pretty well put anything in there that you want, that you love. As long as you find a recipe that's kind of similar and you follow the headspace guide, that's the key. Um, when in doubt, just choose an inch and a half in a big jar like that. And process at 90 minutes for 15 pounds, 15 pounds per square inch. So meat products are the ones that are really, um, you know, they take a long time, but they're worth doing. And it gives you that level of resilience. And what I like also about, about canning or pressure canning in particular is that when you've got, uh, you know, when you've got an abundance in your garden or you've got, there's an abundance of product in the grocery store, like if green onions go on sale, I will go. And um, if I don't have anything, even in the wintertime, if I don't have anything growing in the garden and I see organic green onions for sale, I'll buy a bunch of them, bring them home, chop them up, put them in my dehydrator. So I'm being an opportunist when things are abundant. And it's the same thing at home when I've got stuff growing in the garden and I'm thinking, God, what am I gonna do with all this stuff? And you know, I can, I can process it really quickly, get it all prepped, throw it in a pressure canner and I've got it. So I'm capturing the moment. So this gives me the option to do that um, and also diversify my food storage options. Is that it? Thank you, Carmen. <laughs> Great. All right, folks. Well, we're going to wrap up the live stream. And uh, if you are interested in presenting at a future Permaculture Calgary Guild event, let me know. And we'll. And next, next month we'll do bone broth and lard. Oh, awesome. Oh, next month lard. we're doing bone broth and yard. Lard. Yard. Lard. Wow. Lard awesome. Lard in the yard. Lard in the yard. <clears throat> All right. So thanks so much, guys. Uh, stick around. We've got the. You wanted to say something? Now oh, we don't sorry. have to all admit to each other how we did it. <laughs> 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 right on.